All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Books with Thanks back again with another video. I am so grateful to be joined this evening uh, by Mr. Stephen Erickson, author of Malazan Book of the Fallen, the ongoing Carcanus and Witness trilogies, the Willful Child books, uh, just to name a few. I'm beyond excited that uh, you've been kind enough to join me here. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um... You mentioned the willful child books. We're not going to talk those, are we? No, 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 no. Because that, no, that would just, be a first. That would yeah, be an absolute no. first. I, yeah. I, I actually, I have, I picked them up. Uh, I haven't started reading them. I feel like, uh, not to get too off track, but I haven't really watched Star Trek. Uh, oh, I've watched one or two episodes here and there, and I feel like that might be a prerequisite for, for kind getting of, some of the stuff in it. Okay. Kind of, but, but not entirely. I mean, if if you just have a general sense of the cultural place of the original star trek and captain kirk okay you know uh you know whatever that sense is of of him um in our zeitgeist then that's good enough okay I mean, there'll be a lot of in jokes that if you're familiar with the various films um you know sure. there, there's plays off of that stuff okay i guess the titles themselves yeah are... yeah <laughs> definitely yeah okay yeah. Uh, all right yes yeah, sorry yeah, no. okay uh, to go off on that um uh but yeah i guess uh what we what i do really kind of want to focus on today uh is the carcanus uh prequel books mm -hmm. uh because there's a few interviews out there a ton of content on booktube all about uh the 10 book uh Malazan book of the fallen series mm -hmm. uh there's significantly less about uh the carcanus books i, I know i believe raf blue tax has some stuff uh Niffle rog and philip chase did one or two reviews um aside from those i haven't been or I haven't found too much other stuff, uh, too much other Carcanus no. content. No, and, and I think a lot of people are holding off and even looking at them because the third book is not yet out. And, okay, sure, sure. Right, so um, I think uh, fandom in fantasy especially um, are probably now a bit more reluctant to commit to a series uh, until Maybe. it's done. Right. Yeah, that's fair enough. So Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah where just with where a few notable series are at um mm -hmm. yeah 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 and you know writers are not you know, we're not machines so right. you know, we, um we do the best we can and and you know as you get older um you have to sort of marshal your energies and, and be more very focused i guess uh more so than than at least for me than i used to be um so uh, I have to sort of measure out where and when uh, I'm going to be addressing things. And it's taken a while. I mean, I think I have about 300, pa 300 pages written of Walk in Shadow, the okay. third one. Um, but I was kind of wandering around in the narrative. And it wasn't until um, I hit a scene with Renard that everything sort of fell into place. And so now I know that when I get back to it, um, I'm finishing No Life Forsaken right now. Right. Then I'm going to uh, crank out a, a quick novella, a Bokelin Corporal Brooch novella. Yeah. Um, and then that's kind of a, a palate cleanser. And then I'll I'll um, return to Walk in Shadow. And I'm pretty confident now that because I sort of found my feet, um, the the writing of the book should proceed pretty pretty much seamlessly. Okay. doesn't mean I'm going to keep everything in the 300 pages I've already written or in the order in which uh, they presently appear. But um, I, like I said, once I returned to Renard, um, everything, everything felt more familiar, I guess, in a sense about where mm -hmm. I was going to head. All right. All right. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, that's great to hear about Renard. I definitely plan on asking a few character specific uh kind of focused questions uh, a little further down uh but i thought maybe to start i might just ask a few broader things uh mm -hmm. like i guess number one being at what point while you were working on book of the fallen uh did you start to think about writing this prequel trilogy um i think there were hints of it um maybe as early as midnight tides okay um I think is that where Sandalath Drew Corlat is first introduced? Uh I'm not sure. yes. That could be uh, Reaper's Tale. Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um I I believe she comes in in that one. Uh, yeah. because, yes, because she meets um the uh 
blacksmith by the time that reaper's gale comes around with all um, yes yeah with, with all right right um yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so that that planted the seed but it was also planted with some flashbacks in memories of ice i think um where uh anamander rake well actually um and is you know, has a character is a character there and so that's when I think probably then I started building the backstory in my head um of, of uh what was being played out um so, uh, revolving around the turning away of mother dark <clears throat> so yeah I'd say memories of ice I first touched on it but it really uh started to take shape while writing toll the hounds Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, are, I guess the it might be an understatement to say that the style is a little bit different uh, with Parkanis than very Parkinus. different. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of curious if you were trying to emulate certain author or certain things that you had read with choosing that different style, uh, or if maybe the style is just more tied to the different narrators that you chose for each respect uh, <clears throat> um sorry that's a bit no no a it, question I'm, I'm just trying to sort of how i should approach this um uh, a lot of my early writing uh in my writing programs that i went to um well I, first of all i was reading voraciously with within every genre imaginable and there was stuff that i really liked that um I took as uh, almost stylistic, stylistic guides, if you will. Yeah. And so early on uh, with my short stories, I was basically writing each story that I put into the workshop in a completely different style. And uh, it used to really sort of confound uh, the instructors and the teachers because in, in many respects, they couldn't recognize me from one story to the next but i was just trying out all these different voices and styles um and i think that's part of a formative process where um you you pick up on the styles of the things that that you enjoy as a reader and you try them out um and then as you proceed um many of those styles start merging into one which then becomes the style that you may choose for a particular particular thing so I chose a particular style for the Malazan Book of the Fallen, um, which was kind of a blending of Stephen Donaldson and Glenn Cook. So like two opposite ends stylistically. And I just, you know, try to fuse them together. And then that produced uh, the, the um, Malazan Book of the Fallen style. But I always knew that, you know, if I wanted to, I could, I could pick any style. And so, um, when I went to doing something that was going to be a, a prequel, uh, pushing you know as far back as I could, in terms of the storylines, um, I wanted a, a semblance or a hint of some kind of archaic element to to the style I wanted to use, but I didn't want to do anything like um, I don't know, Once in Future King or you know the Fairy oh. Queen or something. You know, I, I didn't want that really high diction. Um, well, it's not a high diction. Um, highly lyrical turn of the century um, approach to fantasy, which uh, Tolkien, of course, picked up on and, right. and made full use of. Um, so I didn't want to go in that direction. So I went back further and I downloaded um, the collected works of Shakespeare and I just read it all. Okay. Um, and I, did, I wasn't sure when I started um, what I was going to be able to absorb um, of that of that particular style because for most part for the most part um this stuff is uh well stage plays um soliloquies you know this kind of stuff so um <clears throat> i wasn't sure how that was going to play out in, in terms of fiction but it quickly became apparent that what i was going to focus on with the new style was the oratory origins of um of storytelling um, as they are sort of uh, expressed through um, stage plays, drama. Um, 
so you have a kind of a, a declamatory um particular style in, in which people can stand and speechify quite literally um which is you know i mean that that began in, in classical greece but it really sort of uh, becomes formalized uh in the time of shakespeare in terms of how plays are presented um and so one of the things i took note of was because a lot of these lines of dialogue were meant to be spoken um that there is a particular cadence built in and it's usually kind of breath length cadence and then i thought well okay that might be interesting to try to write um an entire novel in that in that breath length cadence um and so I sat down and uh, started exploring that. And I thought, well, I, I need a pretty traditional style of story. Uh, and if you look at the, the bare bones of Forge of Darkness, um, it's a young boy's coming of age story, which is pretty traditional for fantasy. Um, so I, I sort of landed on that as uh in terms of story being something quite recognizable to the audience uh who are fan you know uh, fans of fantasy um and then with that familiarity then i could start messing around with the actual cadence and diction and style and um i found it very seductive very quickly and to slide into that style was just great fun because it allows for greater use of poetics uh within within the narrative um and i love that. that that was great fun so it was kind of a break away from uh, the style I, i'd set up and used in the malazan book of the fallen um and i needed that you know I, I started writing forge of darkness only a few weeks after i finished the crippled god um, i probably should have waited a year but i didn't uh but i needed i needed a fresh voice um otherwise there's no way i could you know i didn't want to keep writing um in the style of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, because that style is very deliberate and specific to that story. And each story will, you know, will um, demand its own style. Oh. Long answer, sorry. No, no, that, that's that's wonderful. Um, kind of picking up off of that, uh, and I, I guess I hate to ask a question where I might know where the answer goes a little bit, but how how do you feel audience audiences reactions have been to the change in style uh do you think yeah i i'll just leave yeah it. no i mean it's it's i think a lot of things were happening um i think the, the first error i've made was getting it published getting it done too soon getting it out too soon because what i had noticed right through uh, as each book of the malazan book of the fallen came out there was a kind of a six to eight month lag on the response so that um at least the positive response so a book would come out and there was a site called the malazanempire.com where everybody sort of piled on board and and commented as the books were coming out and initially you know everybody would say well this was the weakest book whichever book right four <laughs> five six seven uh or they didn't like it blah 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 and then six eight months later they would have changed their tune completely and now it's their favorite book um i didn't i didn't give the readers even that kind of kind of amount of time to deal with the crippled god before forge of darkness was basically about to come out so that was too quick a turnaround um i don't think it it, it i didn't let the dust settle and i think it yeah. needed to settle so that's one uh looking back on it, it was probably um you know, if I'd sat on the book uh, for a year and then sent it to my publisher, that may have been, uh, it may have had a better result. Um, but secondly, yeah, it, it it's a traditional story, but it's also a tragedy. And tragedies are, um, they're not the most popular um, narrative form these days, right? They, they've gone out, they've gone out the window. Um, and I was speaking with the people at Smiley's Bar earlier about this. That um, throughout our, uh, you know, all our media, uh, our, all our entertainment, um, once I think, once I think companies and, and distributors started sort of um, having test audiences, 
uh, for films and stuff. And, you know, if a film ends up having a really tragic, sad ending, mm -hmm. you know, the test audiences often said, well, we'd rather have a happy ending. And so they go and reshoot the thing, right? right. I think, you know, tragic tragedy just sort of fell to the wayside. Um, and, I, I, you know, I recognize that early on in, in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, and I, I, I still wanted to keep beating that particular dead and dying horse um, because I think there's something of great value in, in the cathartic uh, aspect of tragedy. Um, so maybe there was resistance to that because it, it's... Uh, Forge of Darkness is certainly, I think, um, a more um, relentlessly grim novel and story than, say, Fall of Light. Um, I think there, there's more humor shows up in Fall of Light. Yeah, with the tableau and the yeah. Or I, well, I don't know if they're tableau, but yeah. Well, Prasic and Dathinar and people like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I knew that was going that was coming, but I needed to really set the stage for for. Um, in Forge of Darkness for, for laying out sort of the inevitability of the, of the civil war that's coming. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a dark, it's a dark book. And it may have been, I don't know, too dark. It's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the, the style itself, um, I knew was a risk. I was taking a risk with it. And uh, I simply hope for the best. And I think it just sort of, yeah, it, it dropped into a gap sort of between um, people's uh, ability to sustain energy within, you know, the works I'm doing. So if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I might have actually, it was probably a year between when I finished The Crippled God and Red Forge of Darkness. And I That's think that good. was, a, and I, I read other fantasy, but I didn't read any of your stuff or uh, any of uh Esselmont stuff in that right, so, time yeah. so right so I, I think it just um it, it was I had waited long enough and I was just eager to get back into it and mm. uh, see a lot of a lot of the characters that I or is, see I guess which of the characters I knew from the the main 10 would show up there um yeah. and that actually kind of leads into my next question and maybe combined with style like when you were making these stylistic decisions and when you decided to uh, really um, kind of go hard on the tragedy uh, kind of idea, were there characters that I, I guess maybe some that you knew had to show up in some way, way, shape or form? And were there others that you thought maybe didn't necessarily need to be there, but you really wanted to rework or not rework hmm. them, but bring them in just to play um, around with them? Well, I think before I even decided on that, um, I, I needed to decide on on the narrative frame, oh. and that narrative frame is is a continuation, if you will, of the narrative revelations that arrive in the crippled god, that make you look back on the series and realize that the two poems that that frame the entire series um, are coming from a particular source. A particular individual and um in that when those poems are addressing they're addressing the reader they're addressing the audience um and so this time around i figured okay if i've set that precedent um it's kind of like sort of raising a little flag saying you know pay attention to, to the framing because the framing is going to tell you a lot about the nature of the story being told and in this case it is a it's Blind Galan, uh, a poet, telling the story to another poet. Right. And the other poet we know as Fisher. Um, and so there's a level of mutual awareness of the manip manipulative powers of narrative. Okay. And so, and, and that's why Galan tells you right at the start, it says, you know, this, this is not a history, you know, I, I, I'm going to drop things, I'm going to pay attention to some things. I'm going to ignore other things. I'm going to fit it to suit the theme that I'm, I'm going to discuss here. And Fisher, he's on board with that because he's, he's also a poet. He's an artist. Um, so there's that other level of um, intention, intentionality going on uh, in the narrative frame, which hopefully helps the reader, helps guide the reader to, to an understanding that 
that which is presented here isn't just a uh, historical recount, you know, th that there is, there is subtext to this stuff. And Galan has reasons for doing what he does and saying what he does, um, and even changing and manipulating the events to suit his purpose, which of course, in the meta sense, is what all, what all artists do. <laughs> Every author does that. Right? Uh -huh. So this is just more upfront. It's more uh, direct. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess um, maybe uh, continuing on that point, you focus, at least in Forge of Darkness, uh, a lot on the point of view of uh, Kataspala. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. that right. Uh, uh, you got it. Uh, but him being another artist mm -hmm. in this story that these or that one artist is telling another, like how. I, I, would you would you care to comment on how much I guess page time that you gave Kataspala? Um, maybe aside from just aside from and including, obviously his relatives are very important to a lot of the tragedy that yeah. takes yeah. place. But yeah, yeah he was interesting. Um, I kind of stumbled on him uh, when I was writing Toll the Hounds because um, he's on the wagon, right? <laughs> Carving tattoos. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so I got quite sort of fascinated on thinking about his mindset and where he's coming from. And that whole uh, self-aware kind of notion of uh, the artist and the artist's creation. Um, and so that sort of sat in the back of my mind. And then uh, working out the the various uh, family groupings uh, of Forge, Forge of Darkness. Um, yeah, I wanted something hinting at the forbidden in, in Kataspala, um, which then ties into um, his sister and her betrothal and um, his notions of, of what constitutes uh, beauty but also his obsessions and and then finally um his fearlessness as an artist um and so it would have been easy i suppose to just you know turn Kataspala into i don't know um a poet um okay. but i like the visual medium that that he's exploring and um you know, so much of, of especially portraiture is all about propaganda historically. Um, and I wanted him to be aware of that and 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 sort of be um, prepared to follow along in, in the requirements, but uh, having no real belief um, or rather being cynical towards all of that and, and the power structures at play. Um, and so then then it becomes a question of what is the role of an artist in, in a society. Um, and that's where I could I could sort of let Kataspala loose and he could just sort of um, contemplate these things as, as society is breaking down around him. Um, as he, you know, he rides through the forest and stumbles on body after body. So what is the role of the artist in, in, in this context? Um, and it seems to be a valid question. I mean, it's I, I, I mean, think of the art that's going to emerge from the Ukraine, for example, right. the consequence of this invasion. Um, think of the art that was produced in Central America um, in places with very repressive regimes, uh, generating something that you know we later called magic realism as, as this kind of um, this social pressure that is actually manifesting itself. Um, in the artwork that that quite often is quite subversive but it gets past the censors because it's it's magic realist or it's science fiction or it's fantasy right. and you know most totalitarians and, and censorists um they don't understand they don't understand subtext anyway so they're going to miss all that shit <laughs> so these things you know you get away with it um i think another great example would be uh, jazz musicians in the Czech Republic after the um, occupation and it got folded into the Soviet Union. I mean, you wouldn't think of jazz musicians as being enemies of the state, but they actually were <laughs> in the Czech Republic, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was something 
unfettered and wild and um, uncontrollable in, in, their, in their interpretation of music. And that was deemed as a, as a threat. So art does play a huge role in these things. And so for me, um, especially where visual art painting uh, is so often in service to the state uh, or in service to the status quo, uh, I wanted an artist who was going to reject that. But then he needed a personal reason to reject it as well. So he got that, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, so I do have like some kind of prepared questions, but with your answers, you're giving me so many kind of things to, to think about. And I guess thinking about an artist with uh, like who does portraits and stuff, or like an actual uh, and a painter um, in Forge of Darkness. Uh, in Fall of Light, I feel like we don't really have many references to art like that so much as we have references to um statues and mm -hmm. uh, sculptures uh yeah. and i i guess i'm curious if uh, what, what went behind the decision to focus more on um sculptures and things like that and fall of light yeah um you're right it, it and it's a conscious it was a conscious thing i mean the first one was going to be the painting um second was going to be um sculpture um and I think for the third, I've already, I mean, the, there's poetic stuff already going through it. And there, there's, in the first two books, we, we, we do have people quoting some earlier poems and that kind of stuff from their uh -huh. culture. So I thought, well, okay, maybe I could do poetry. Um, but I, I, I know there... I think I, I'd have to go back to my notes to figure out what my third one was. Um, it certainly could be music, um, okay. but I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But I do know that I, I was aware of making that switch. Yeah, it's yeah. been a long time. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what was it, 20, I guess, was it published in 2016, Fall of Light? Could be, could be. Oh, okay, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, as for your prepared questions, I, I'm I'm actually in many ways far happier if we riff on what we're saying to each other. Sure, yeah. Because I think it's more organic and it, it, it's um, more spontaneous. And to me, that's just, yeah, it's better than having your list. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I, I think those are just in case I yeah. get, get exactly. stopped or, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also, I haven't mentioned this yet, but... Um, I, for anyone who's watching this, um, spoiler warning. <laughs> like I, I, I don't want you to feel. Yeah. Bad no, no, you, yeah. Or, yeah. When, when you when you uh, assemble this tape, put something in really early on about spoilers. Right. right. Yeah, I've been trying to avoid them, but um, I think right. I, I think I've mostly avoided them. But okay. Yeah. 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 Like I think the most detailed stuff we've talked about was uh, Catasbala, but uh, aside yeah. from that, yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'm trying to think of a, a place to go uh, from here. Um, I, I guess it, we don't, so you mentioned that Shakespeare had an influence on uh, the sort of rhythm of uh, like the, the writing, right? Um, so I'm curious if when you were considering uh, these artists, if like playwrights or if um, theater, or a place for theater um, ever um, across your mind? No, not really. I think that's what I was going to do. I was going to do the bard. Oh. The bard is going to be part of uh, Walk in Shadow. Okay, but okay. sorry, um, I, don't, I don't mean to give away things. That... No, 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 no. <laughs> that, 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 like you said, that's it's just a thread that runs through, and and you know, if people notice it, that's fine. It's no mm -hmm. big deal. Um, so, yes, there is an examination of the role of art um, in society, uh, in any society, in every society, in cultures, um, at moments of um, extreme history, if you will. So that's that's sort of already set in place. But in terms of stage production, no, I don't think I don't think so, because I kind of in my mind anyways, I, I put the entire set of Carcanus as a trilogy 
on stage. Okay. Um, and so that that's sort of sitting in the back of my mind that, um, you know, when Prazek and, and Dathanar uh, start pontificating and, and talking back and forth as they're writing, I mean, you need not be writing for that to happen, right? It's it's right. it's a conversation. Um, it's quite static in that respect. And the only thing that's moving are their horses under them and the landscape around them. But um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Um, and it, it, it's interesting because it makes, as a writer, I, it makes you approach your action scenes very differently. Um, so that there's less incentive to actually go hard into, you know, really, really specific action. Um, because that's actually not the important part, right? It's, it's um, especially when you're looking at something like a civil war. Well, those are pretty universally recognizable as, as uh, events. And the same things play out because that's human nature. So uh, I have no interest in, in reveling in it and glorying in it and, and any of that stuff. Um, so, I mean, the whole Catasbala opening scene or the scene in the forest, that's all after the fact, right? Nothing was seen, uh, only the, the aftermath. And that made sense um, for the, the approach I was taking for this trilogy, which is why everything in a sense led up to what I did at the end of Fall of Light. I, I, I sort of had a sense uh, that, that might've been where you, where you were going uh, with that. Uh, and kind of just to comment a little more on that, uh, the decision to, I mean, you, you do show the conflict at the end, just from very kind of, I don't know if strange is the right word, but different well, they're strange. vantage yeah. points. Um, and also some of it's after the fact, some of it's speculation about what's happening. Um, I, I, I actually am curious. I haven't read like a ton of reviews of your work, but um, I, I'm curious if there were particular re reviews that you came across where people were criticizing the way that. Oh yeah, yeah. Battle. Lots of people didn't like that ending. They wanted the big battle. Yeah. Oh. And I was <laughs> by that point. I was pretty sick of writing big battles. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, been there, done that. Didn't really, didn't really see the point. Um, <laughs> and also knew that you know. With the third book, Walk in Shadow, we are heading to uh, existentially the biggest battle that could possibly exist, which is against death itself. So we don't really need a lot, you know, um, of the, the the sword on sword uh, clashing going on here at all. Um, plus, I wanted I wanted more of a sense of the inevitability um, and almost the absence of free will in the major players that each of them is forced into this circumstance. Um, so they are in, in effect made pawns by, the, by their circumstance and uh, playing pieces on, on, on a board. And so what that's what sort of gave me the inspiration to um, have the game in the ditch occurring between a madman who has returned to, to, to childhood uh, and his opponent, um, a traumatized child who is struggling towards adulthood. And in that that space in between is where the insanity of the battle takes place. Um, so that, to me, that that made a lot more sense, if you will, um, to towards the point I was trying to make. But I knew it, would, I knew it was gonna piss people off because oh. everybody wants the big battle at the end. And I just, I fought it and fought it and fought it. I did not want to write that. Oh. Um, and I remember I was sending um, chapters of this uh, to AP as my advanced reader um, mm -hmm. while I was writing it and just uh, railing at the fact that um, this, this approach to writing this battle, to write a battle in which I don't write the battle, um, was actually harder than, than actually if I had sat down and just wrote the freaking battle. <laughs> you know, this was much harder. Um, so it, it was, yeah, it was um, very challenging structurally. Um, the question of how I was going to lay it out. And at one point, I know I had two entirely different sets of conversations that Anna Rake had. 
And I was thinking, well, do I pick one and drop the other? And then I decided, no, I'll use them both because, you know, it's, uh, it's one is an imagined one and, and one is possibly not imagined. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's all coming through from, from Galan, the poet, the poet. Mm -hmm. So he can play those games as well. And he even seems uh, very frustrated with uh, yeah. telling you that. <laughs> Granted, I'm sure that's a bit of a meta oh, yeah. generation thing. Absolutely. Uh, oh, yeah. There's I, a lot of throwing our hands up in despair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I sort of like uh, with the opening of Fall of Light, there's, or he has a couple pages uh, where he's just, or where uh, Galan is just speaking. And then at the end of it, he says something like, to hell with it, here, have a battle. And yep. So then there is a there is a big battle at the beginning of or a decent sized battle at the beginning of the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just it. The, the, the whole novel is inverted that way, right? Oh. Um, the battle comes at the beginning, and uh, but the battle is not the important part. It, the important part is Renard and her foreshadowing that mm -hmm. leads directly to the end, the final scene of the novel. Right. So, right. I think uh, if that is easily and i'm sure i'm not alone here um among uh Karkana's fans but the what renard chooses to do at the end of uh, fall of light is one of the biggest things i'm eager for uh walk in shadow uh to mm -hmm. see if there's a lot of reflection from her or other characters mm -hmm. just because i i feel like with the amount of time that you give the characters to sort of just consider the world around them in these books compared to uh, some of your other works. Uh, it often kind of helps me think about why they're doing the things they're doing. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm hungry for that from her a little more. Like, I think I see, I think I understand why she makes that choice in the end, but I, I'm just so curious to know the aftermath and to, to understand why and especially because uh bath or sander is easily one of my favorite uh parts of this story uh i guess mm -hmm. things in it it he's a person he's a character but he's just he's kind of a he's a figurehead so yeah mm. sorry i i just yeah. wanted to say uh, yeah yeah it's, uh, it's interesting um because I, I remember when i when i got to the scene in walk in shadow where i was finally the first 300 pages are avoiding uh, the Civil War entirely. And uh, I, I mean, subconsciously, yeah, I was just, I did not want to go there. Uh, I didn't feel ready to go there. Um, and so I thought, well, how can I sort of work my way in through the back door, back into Carcanus, into Curl Galane? Um, and that's where I stumbled on, well, I think initially Cataspala, but then secondly, um, Renard. And once I got to Renard, um, that's when everything sort of opened up. And I realized that up until this point, um, Renard has, in terms of how I portrayed her as a character, um, she is a correlate to Tavor. And I need, if I think about that in, 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 with respect to this trilogy, then suddenly everything, everything starts making sense. Yeah. Um, but I mean, both Urosander and Renard are, um, they're mysteries. And so that final scene um, with them after the wedding, that's, I, I, won't get it, I won't spoil any more than that. No. Um, there's a lot of ambivalence as to the levels of awareness of what's about to happen for both of the characters. Mm -hmm. And I want that ambivalence in place. Um, I want the question to be just lingering, hopefully in the reader's mind, that um, Erwo Sander was aware of what was going to happen and invited it. Yeah. Um, and so in that sense, it is like the actions of actors on a, on a, on a, a stage um, in a very Shakespearean fashion, um, where everything plays out in the throne room, as it were. Well, this one plays out in, 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 you know, in the back room but it's basically the same kind of thing. And so everybody has their role to play. They have their part to play and there's no escaping it. And I want, I want that idea to just sort of be hovering around in terms of uh, the decisions that were made and whether even Renard was free to do otherwise, because she may not have been. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I, I'd say certainly uh, it seems like Ur Sander, the, the whole, uh, especially all of Fall of Light, he seems so stuck and so sort of petrified in that position. Um, and well, reluctant. Yeah. He's reluctant. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. He's, he's tired. He wants to just, you know, um, not bother anybody else and, and just fade into the into the into history. Right. And they don't let that happen. Right. So, so how do you fight that? Right. Right. Um, how do you reject I, it? Uh -huh. I, I wonder if there's a when you're writing these characters, is there ever a sense of uh, sort of you're thinking, what am I doing to them? Or like, what what am I putting them through? Uh, like what you're putting Ursander through by having the civil war happen right after he's become a war hero. And of course, mm -hmm. there's only one place for him to really fit into that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh no, I don't think so. Um, the, for me, the key to to inhabiting a character um, relates to a kind of respect, um, and you honor you honor their fates. Um, and how could you not? Because you're the one designing those fates, right? You're the one setting everything up for them to um, to suffer the consequences, and so. It in a sense, it is very much actors on a stage and, and everybody has a role to play. And um, I suppose some actors will take on roles and then hate the director for, you know, <laughs> putting them in the wrong place in the wrong situation. I suppose that happens. But those are living people. So they have a reason to, you know, they have justification to resist. Um, but these are are not living people. They're, they're fictional creations. And so um as much as you want to sort of convey the uh, that verisimilitude that you know they, they are living and breathing which is you know part of the creative process one hopes um ultimately they aren't and right. and that's why you know that's why galan is is saying that you know he's he is the one setting all this up for you for you the in this case fisher the other uh artist um and Fisher certainly understands the reasons for it, and and so does Galen. So the rest of us, we're just sort of sitting back and, and watching. Okay. I guess I really want to uh, maybe ask, and I've sort of resisted the urge to bring him up too much uh, so far, but speaking of characters reluctant um, uh, to be playing the parts that they're playing, um, Rise, uh, Rise Herit, Herat, Herat, Herat uh, is uh, another one of my uh, favorites, particularly in Fall of Light, mm. and uh, because he seems just, he's so, he's so upset about what historians do and what, what he's been doing and this system he's been a part of. Now, part mm. of that might be because I um, have a uh, BA and a, and a master's in history. So uh, I've been around conversations like that uh, a mm -hmm. lot, the sort of, oh no, what's the point of what we're doing? Uh, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm curious if you'd well, like to yeah, comment he's interesting. on that. Yeah, he, he tries to establish uh, an objectivity, objectivity to the whole situation. Um, but that's, it's an illusion. Right. Um, and and that's why for for this particular novel, uh, Fall of Light, especially, he is drawn into a, becoming a participant um, in the um, manipulation of some pretty major characters, um, including the deception uh, involving uh, those characters. So um, and I think the uh, the priestess. She calls him out on that a few times, um, basically saying, you know, you cannot just stand back and write, you know, write down the events. Uh, you've played a role in these things. Um, and I think that that's fairly, uh, it should be at least recognized that historians do play roles uh, in actual um, real world consequences um, as a result of how they interpret past events. I mean, that's part of our myth making. Um, it's part of our like our, our national myth making. 
Um, and uh, yeah, these things do do lead to um, at times um, horrendous activities, you know. Uh, uh, and so there is no real objectivity in this case. Um, uh, we're all culturally compromised in some fashion or another. Um, I, you know, I, when I started, and, and one of my minors was history, the other was classics. Um, we were just at that point moving into uh, a kind of um, a new understanding of approaching history, uh, which I think technically was called, in, at least in classes, a social history. Yeah. And that, you know, it, I'm sure you know this, right? It, it's that recognition of, of the boots on the ground you know, of your average person and how do they live? And um, never mind, you know, the main uh, lineages and royalty and great generals and all the rest. Um, uh, what is the day to day existence like uh, in these time periods? Um, and then to explore that, at least through whatever. Uh, written materials or artistic, right? I mean, think of um, uh, what was it, Hogarth, yeah, the British painter, who um, painted the, the yeah. The, he did a whole bunch of illustrations on sort of a a, a rake style character who then falls into disgrace and ruin, and, and so the social commentary going on in all these illustrations, um, uh, and so. <clears throat> yeah, art does play uh, play a huge role in this. Um, in that sort of uh, you look at Dickens and, and you know what he did in terms of addressing poverty um, in Victorian Britain. So uh, I think that role is is certainly front and center, at least with Catasbala and various other characters. Um, and Rise Harad, of course, the historian. Uh, where does he end up? Um, he ends up down among the, the sculptures, doesn't he? Right, um, right. Basically, you know, like a half mad pinball bouncing, you know, what from one sculpture to the next. And so these these edifices of the past, uh, which have been raised up and, and glorified and made heroic or grotesque. I mean, it depends on uh, the work. Um, is a thing that's literally bludgeoning him as he's stumbling out of that room. Um, I, I mean, that was pretty bit, pretty much. Um, on the point, on the nose, I think it's, yeah. it's the phrase you would use. Yeah. But I think by that point, I was probably sort of at a stage where I thought on the nose was probably the best option. But anyways, um, yeah, I will explore and have explored uh, the notions and the interchange between uh, history um, as recorded, as observed, as witnessed, um, and the cultural and um, long-term consequences uh, to those things. Uh, it's, it's funny, I mean, archaeology plays that conceit to, to the nth degree, right? We, we dig up a handful of artifacts and then we're, we're talking about huge uh, artistic traditions of, of pottery and style making and types of spear points and all that kind of stuff. And, and we try to extrapolate on the basis of just paltry amount of information um and ultimately it's, it's there, there's an element of absurdity to the whole thing um so anyways yeah that's kind of all in play <laughs> so i know okay you got a degree in history what, what area of history uh well actually i i think i probably owe part of it to the fact i was reading uh Malazin and mm. your works uh, definitely forced me to consider certain aspects of history that i hadn't really uh delved, delved dived into at, at mm -hmm. that point um i uh in my undergraduate program i was really interested in world war one um uh, mm -hmm. that sort of era uh and then going into graduate school I started to study genocide and Holocaust studies and uh, with a particular focus on the experiences of women through uh, genocides uh, and right. how those experiences uh, are, how it, it's not necessarily appropriate to say 
women have it worse than men, but in a lot of uh, very specific ways they do. So how to address that when we're talking about these historical events. And, um, and then uh, I'm an oral historian now. So looking at kind of the questions that, the questions that a female narrator might be asked versus the questions that a male narrator might be asked. Uh, that sort of thing, especially uh, might, about might be asked of of. You mean like being interviewed? Uh, yes, yes, being interviewed, and uh, yeah, if they're being interviewed about certain traumatic uh, moments from their past, mm -hmm. um, uh, my my whole, I guess my master's, uh, we didn't do a, like a technically a thesis. Uh, I did a sort of mini documentary uh, looking right. at what bits of information uh, Holocaust survivors uh, shared with some interviewers and now with other interviewers looking at the questions that were asked and kind of doing a compare or comparative analysis there. Mm. Yeah. Are you, are you going on for a, a doctorate as well or? Uh, not right now. Um, I, yeah, not right now. Uh, I, I've got a, I do uh, oral history right now uh, for a for the Seminole tribe in Florida. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm very kind of happy with that position with that job right, right now. So yeah. yeah, I may in the future, if I want to start look into university jobs and stuff, then I'll definitely go back for a PhD, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounds fascinating. So you uh, go but yeah, just... I, I hope you don't mind my saying that uh, reading uh, Malazan definitely made me think about aspects of society and uh, human life, uh, my own kind of history interests might be leaving out. Um, and so I thank you. I, I thank you so much for kind of, uh, for well, your sure. words inspiring me in a very, very particular direction. Yeah, well, I, I, I have my obsessions, that's for sure. And I, I will, I'll chew them to pieces in my fiction. Um, yeah. And, and I, a part of it is is I guess the recognition of the role that um, the status quo uh, is a necessity to maintain it, it, its own mythology uh, and the role that that plays in reconstructing um, past events uh, you know to, to suit the present narrative right, right. Um, yeah so I, I'm glad to hear you're fighting against that that's cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I also, I, I mean, before I lose the thought, um, mm. what you just said and a couple mentions of Shakespeare so far um, make me think about history and Shakespeare as a historian uh, and, mm. but also a storyteller uh, through his histories. Um, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I've never read the Henry the Sixth Mm -hmm. trilogy uh, but i like today i'm at the end of act two of henry the sixth part three uh, mm -hmm. so i'm i'm making my way through them uh, and i'm really enjoying them i'm curious if when you were going through uh kind of picking up on that the rhythm that you might want to use um from shakespeare if anything in particular about his histories affected um histories yeah uh my sense is he was a hell of a lot more subversive than we give him credit for. Um, and his approach to nobility and royalty um, doesn't exactly paint them in pretty lights, does it? No. Ultimately, <laughs> no, it really doesn't. And, and then you, you bear in mind that the context of this is these are plays that are being shown to, to commoners uh, in many respects. Um, and they're no fools either, right? So mm -hmm. there, there's a whole kind of social satire that is, that is to me, very present, very present in, in Shakespeare. Um, and if you start, if you, if you do an analysis of Shakespeare without a sense of humor, you've kind of lost, you, you've lost before you even started. Mm -hmm. Because, there, I mean, some of the pun work um, in his language is just, it's great. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So... The approach with which the approach we take on on the historical historical creative documents like Shakespeare, um, uh, 
they in turn reveal something about um, our intention, if you will. Um, and our intention then um, dictates what we see and what we don't see, what we detect and what we don't detect, uh, what goes over our head and, and all this kind of stuff. So um, to me, it's, it's always, there's so many different sides of these things. Um, and I think, especially in the modern age, we're, we're bound up in a, a kind of literalism um, that probably did not exist back then. And that there, in a more general sense, and probably going right back, I would say, I would say definitely going back to the Bronze Age, um, audiences understood metaphor when it came to legends and myths far better than we do. Mm -hmm. um, and it always struck me as strange when, you know, people would look at an old, I don't know, Greek myth and, and think, well, yeah, the people were primitive back then and they believed that there was big giant god up in the mountains throwing thunderbolts. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. that, that presumes a level of credulity that even a five-year-old doesn't have, right. All right? So we have to think in, in a different sense. We have to think that this, these stories have other functions, they have other purposes. Um, and, and most of those would be metaphorical, but also uh, mnemonic because we're more likely to remember a story about a god throwing a thunderbolt because he got jealous then we are, um, there was a storm, you know, up around Mount Vesuvius in 351 BC. Right. That's, that's a series of facts. You're not going to remember that crap, right? That's the weather report. Yeah, but then you get the story, and now that gets passed along. Um, and the Iliad, I think, would be a great example of that, where story of a historical event was uh, made metaphoric, in a sense. Um, and has survived to this day. So, and, and certainly survives as an oral tradition into the Bron into the Iron Age, where, where it finally gets written down. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, there's other functions to these old myths and stuff. And I think you don't give them enough, we don't give our ancestors enough credit or enough mm -hmm. intelligence. Mm -hmm. They were smart. Yeah. Uh, I... Maybe on that note, are there any other pet peeves uh, that you might have? Or pet peeve is probably too light of a term for it. But um, any other sort of frustrations that you have like that when people say, oh, people back then didn't think the same or with the same depth of people today? Anything along those? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I talk, I'm talking apparently. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'll keep it, but I'm writing a book on 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 writing. Right. It's show, yeah, it's showing up in there, where I talk about what I basically two labels: literalist and metaphorist, uh, and view the artist uh, of any medium uh, as almost of necessity being a metaphorist. And we may actually be dying out. We may actually that may be disappearing uh, culturally. Um, and so I do talk a lot. Uh, I talk about that a fair bit in, in this book, which means is it really a book about writing no I'm, i don't know what the hell it is but it, it has elements of that and a lot of autobiographical stuff and then a lot of my um post archaeological i guess uh post career as an archaeologist um observations on and thoughts regarding um our deep past and our histories uh, ancient history and all that kind of stuff so yeah I, i'm kind of meandering all over the place as i write this thing and it's, um not really worried about structure at the moment, but um, I guess AP will have to deal with that. So. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Um, I guess maybe to bring things a little bit back closer to uh, Carcanus, uh, mm -hmm. it is set so long before uh, Molasses and Book of the Fallen. Uh, so are there any, or does that idea of even though these people existed so many thousands of years before, um, you can see they're thinking, or a, a lot of the same themes might be coming up as came up in Book of the Fallen. Uh, is any part of that, like, I guess I'm not really sure how to phrase the question, um, but is there an effort to show that way back then in Carcanus, uh, in the 
kind of prime um or like maybe early decline um mm. it that they were just as smart or just as capable of manipulation and all this this sort of thing sure uh yeah it, it it's basically um taking those mythologized characters of from the Malazan setting and dragging them putting their feet on the ground and and showing um all the flaws um and showing sort of where they where some formational um flaws take place that have consequences right into the Malazan series yeah for sure mm -hmm. yeah uh, I mean otherwise there's no way to you know what the audience that all our books are, are headed towards our human beings and so we need to address the human condition um and if you create um if you attempt to create a society and a culture that um bears none of those characteristics then you i don't think it's possible but you would lose a reader pretty quickly so there needs to be you know things that we recognize uh, in these characters who are walking around on the page for sure uh i'd say without a doubt uh animander rake is one of the most kind of mythologized characters mm -hmm. in book of the fallen um and i'd say he takes a again returning maybe to some of the more reluctant characters uh, mm -hmm. in Carcanus, he takes a sort of reluctant uh back seat and like to a lot of the action um mm -hmm. and yeah he literally he wants to get into the action but mother dark won't let him um yeah i'm curious about uh your decision to include him in the story uh but sort of try to get him away from yeah, well, Galan says at the beginning, right, that you may think this is Anamanda Rake's story, but it's it's not his story. Right. Um, so Galan has a particular agenda regarding, you know, he has his reasons uh, for putting Rake to one side. Um, and I guess by the end of it, you can decide whether those were valid reasons or not. Um, you know, it's up to the reader. Um, but yes, I did want a sense of everybody's being forced into particular corners and, and there's an inevitability that that is taking place here um which certainly seems to be borne out through most historical accounts of uh, revolution or civil war um there is a strange inevitability that that gathers its own momentum and the tide just sweeps over and um you know we can often delude ourselves into thinking well that was you know that was back then that was those people that's not us but you know, it can happen in a flash mm -hmm. so um so here you have these main players um and they just see you know whatever direction they turn in they turn towards the door closes until there, there's one path ahead um that's kind of what this story is about i think mm -hmm. yeah so some faithful decisions are coming in walk in shadow all right all right um uh, i guess i i feel sort of bad that so many of my questions and like comments on characters and stuff have all been from the uh carcanus or like the civil war kind of part of the story and i haven't really talked about uh the jagged or hood or, or hood specifically or uh draconis's son and coria and uh everything mm -hmm. up there um would you say for a question i guess would you say that you're you're trying to do a lot of the same things just in two separate settings there or is there some sort of like or is there some sort of balance that you're trying to strike between those two halves of the story yeah structurally i think that there has to be a balance struck um things will be initially confusing i think in walk and shadow um i'm far less specific on setting uh, when I open this novel. Um, and that's not accidental. It, it's quite deliberate. Um, and I think I need I need that sense. But writing the Jag uh, was always great fun. Um, the the uh, Lana Rook and, and Hannah Co and all the rest um, was just uh, an absolute delight to write. Um, but for me, you know, if, if I think back on some of the favorite, what I think is my best writing uh, in those stories, um, 
Let's see. I'll, let's take him one at a time. Forge of Darkness. Um, Arathan's relationship with his father, with Draconis, um, to me feels uh, to be on solid ground in terms of I, I'm comfortable with both of those characters and how they played out. Um, that group's interaction with Olor Thiel, I think, was one of the, the, the top scenes for me uh, in writing that and how that plays out uh, with her in the tree at the very yeah. end. Yeah. Um, also down by, I think, down by the lake. Was it a lake? And also, the, yeah, there's a dream sequence as well about babies being picked out of the and thrown down. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that all, to me, thematically, that's really tight. That's really sort of tight, tightly played out. Um, a character I never expected to be of such interest um, is the one who initially uh, gets his, you know, his face kicked in um, as just a guard and is left left behind and, and sort of kicked out of the the escort. Who then ends up with the, uh, I guess, with Urasander's forces and is caught up in the wedding um, sequence, and then becomes part of the Sheikh. That storyline, um, that one just sort of organically grew out of out of the scenes, and uh, he became a really really interesting character because he's basically a character for whom redemption is not possible, right? right? Um, and so, what do you do at that point? Uh, you have two choices: you either take your own life, or you at least make the effort uh, of redemption, of reconciliation of some form. But it is not possible. So. You know what kind of existence is that and so that i, I got really interested in, in writing that stuff up um fall of light i thought uh i was pleased with the opening sequence um the battle scene and how that is framed by um the the children uh and playing Lord, yeah playing yeah and how that escalates um which is basically you know uh metaphor for the entire novel how <laughs> everything escalates right childish childish reactions and, and it just gets worse um and let's see what else um oh yeah the uh, the the arrival of the hust um and various things there i won't spoil too much but um all that stuff that takes place in that camp um mm -hmm. <laughs> Before the arrival of Prasik Dathnar and afterwards. And for me, yeah, the final, uh, the non-battle battle, battle uh, was certainly, um, I think, I think I, I did what I wanted to do in that. So that's basically, that's how I measure whether uh, I'm, I'm happy or not. Yes. Not the audience response, but whether I did what I wanted to do. Um, sure, sure. Yeah. And I, 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 as one of the audience, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, definitely cool. my bias is more, I enjoyed the uh, Rise uh, rise Rats part of it, mm -hmm. with, as you said, him pinballing around with the sculptures um, and all the very kind of pointed imagery there, uh, but uh, also the toy soldiers um, and mm -hmm. at war. And uh, I, Maybe you just mentioned uh, it there, the Hust, uh, and uh, maybe now would you mind talking a little bit about your approach to the theme of um, cowardice in? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a character I, I, I thought I would, I would try out um, and, and yet still seek to find sympathy in that particular uh, mm -hmm. state of mind. Um, I don't know if I've succeeded or not, but uh, he was a fun character to to return to. And what made it interesting were were the interactions of the people around him and and where they're placing him in their mindset. Um, and yeah, there's that whole thing going on with uh, the serial killing going on in the camp and all the rest. Yeah, there's, right. there's plenty going on in there. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Prazik and Dathinar are uh, so hilariously kind of just forced into that uh yeah. I, I am curious when you're writing a duo like them does I guess the process of making them funny and writing them how is, is that different than writing like uh Tehol and Bug from Book of the Fallen like are, 
Yeah. Well, I think to hole and bug are, are all about the interplay between um, actual circumstance okay. uh, and 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 language, and that's where they find that sort of absurdity um, is generated. Prazik and Dathan are, are um, circumstances is far less relevant than almost a, a mock historian point of view on their own actions uh -huh. and the commentary that they they invite or imagine um, as accompanying as a kind of a narrative uh, personal narratives um, and so yeah they, they, I, they're finding humor obviously in language but on a, on a kind of a, a more on a level of social history, I think more than anything else. Like the, you think of the scene where they're riding and they're talking about the peasants and the two kings and right. ridiculous speeches, you know, before the battles occur. Um, that that's the absurdity of, of uh, a kind of fictitious circumstance, but it's one that they they know they're heading towards, and there's no stopping it. So, well. yeah, it's it's different. You're right. I mean, it's very different. Um, but I wouldn't want to make you know all the comedic characters sort of do the same shtick if you know what i mean uh-huh okay right yeah 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 you don't want us to feel like we're just reading tahole and bug yeah 2.0 yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah all right and so and that's always a challenge right i mean shirk Alal, for example has a very different uh comedic effect than say iskar or pust or or crop <laughs> um and or or the bull brothers you know um it, it, it I, I I try to mix it up a fair bit yeah um I maybe uh another comedy example from fall of light could be the uh the three husbands of uh of Lana Lana Rook is that her Lana name? Rook yeah, yeah Lana Rook um I I'm curious how you came up with their sort of I mean all three of them seem like they do very different things as a husband. Um, and I, I'm just curious what writing those scenes was like and your inclusion of that. Uh, it was it was good fun. Um, I certainly wanted a, a fairly unique um, social structure uh, among the, uh, among those, that, that group. Um, but also recognizing that that with with marriage, um, a culture will place specific expectations upon upon the roles that, that are assumed, regardless of gender, which was the whole point. Right? The right. gender is not relevant. The, the, the social forces are the ones that, to a large extent, shape uh, the characters, uh, especially, and you see that in, in the three the three husbands. Um, uh, and the fact that the the uh, it's it's the wife of these three husbands who is actually um the least bound the least tethered of all right. of them so she's 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 definitely in in uh in a position of uh complete power absolute power um over her husbands not only her husbands but all the lovers that she attempts and, right. and you know pursues and all the rest and it was just fun to invert that kind of stuff because you know you get that showing up in in uh, a lot of fiction, but generally it, it's it's from the patriarchal kind of standpoint, and I really wanted to flip that around completely. Um, I don't know. I, um, a good example would be Flashman, uh, George MacDonald Fraser's um, eponymous uh, rake and cad and and womanizer and all the rest. Um, I don't know if you've read the books or not. But I, I haven't. No, they are. Uh, they're fantastic. I mean, and if you if you're an in, at all interested in history, um, the author really does his research. Did his research. Okay. And um, basically, Flashman is a character who was invented in the novel of Tom Brown's School Days, um, and he was a tormentor of the main character. And um, so, in the in that novel, he's eventually. Uh, uh, gets beastly drunk and gets kicked out of the 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 public school that the the kids in. And what George McDonald Fraser did, I think he was an historian. Um, he picks up Flashman's story from there. And then these are kind of the uh, annals 
uh, of his his life story, and he becomes he gets the Victoria Cross and he gets you know all these medals all over the place. But he's a complete coward, and yet he he bamboozles and, and deceives everybody on all sides. And so he ends up in the charge of the Light Brigade. He's in the uh, retreat through Af through the Kabul um, Afghanistan. He's in the uh, the Sepoy Mutiny. Uh, he said he shows up at Custer's Last Stand. Like he is all over the place as his um, character, and it's footnoted all the way through. And it's just uh, it's a hoot to read. But but that is quite traditional, right? You know, it, it's it's a male character sort of um, uh, being an opportunistic uh, individual in in a very patriarchal world, which was you know which the author recognizes is full of full of shit anyway so why not right so <laughs> that to me I mean they're great reads um but I did want to to flip things around with with uh, Ladder Rook and company and so uh and again though a lot of it is 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 kind of you can almost imagine half of that stuff occurring on a stage right in mm -hmm. terms of the interplay between the three husbands especially oh yeah yeah where the the action isn't so much exciting as it is them bickering over who is the yeah. most yeah the most well, important. I mean, and... yeah if you think about it um what's one of the first things they do they they, they kill a dragon you know right. like, and 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 yet resume their conversation you know a few minutes later um, right. yeah yeah okay. um I. If you don't mind, I might go back to the list of some of the things sure. just to see. Um, not necessarily to get too much more serious than uh, than the comedy stuff we've just been talking about, uh, but I did maybe want to talk a little bit about theme uh, while, while I have you here because I feel like I feel like there are certain themes that get picked out from Book of the Fallen that get talked about. Uh, I don't know if I want to say talk to death, but people <laughs> certainly really love to bring up compassion, uh, mm -hmm. which is great and very important in that series. Um, but uh, I I kind of wanted to talk about unique themes or maybe themes that were more unique to Carcanus, uh, mm -hmm. things that you didn't, or maybe just you didn't get a chance to cover in uh, Book of the Fallen. I know I early on a few months ago when I just started my channel I made a video kind of looking at uh the this idea of what's like a just cause and kind of the self-righteous mm. leaders uh, I also looked at uh parent-child relationships uh and including those two and beyond those two uh themes I'm just curious if you'd like to share other things um I don't know um in many respects, um, the Malaysian Book of the Fallen um, was the vehicle in which I threw down onto the page everything I could conceivably think of oh. thematically um, and would return to those themes uh, from as many angles and positions as I, I could conceive of. Um, so when I got to Forge of Darkness, um, the thematic pressure wasn't wasn't there and that in a sense that kind of freed me up um i could be more specific and uh, and approach things for the characters on a far more personal level rather than that, that sort of epic scope um i mean to me that's one of the the main differences between the trilogy and and the previous two ten books is um the scale mm -hmm. uh, i re, you know i reduced the scale um as well as far far down as I possibly could um expanded it slightly in fall of light and it will expand slightly more in walk in shadow before it contracts all over again so um yeah it just gave me gave me freedom to sort of uh explore um I guess I guess themes on a more personal level and, mm -hmm. and the life choices the characters make and people make um the ways in which they see the world uh the way that can be changed in, in an instant uh either uh through their own actions or or find themselves in circumstances they never anticipated and don't know how to deal with um 
And so to me, it, 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 the Carcana stuff feels more personal. I guess that's the best way I'd put it. Um, and that's where I wanted to stay. And I hope to stay there uh, for the Carcanus uh, trilogy uh, in its entirety. Um, so it is different. Um, and I think it, it, it's kind of a, an obvious or not obvious, but uh, a logical uh, response uh, post uh, 10 novels. Um, because that one, like I said, I threw everything there. Um, and there was, no, there was no reason to to do that all over again. Right. Um, I wanted the that ten books to stand um, just as they are. Um, and, and in many ways, it's why I was reluctant to um, go back to it uh, with the Witness trilogy. Um, I held off and held off. And when I eventually went to it, I realized that no, I can I can still do this um, at a smaller scale um and still have fun writing in that world and and that was a bit of a relief because i wasn't sure initially i i, I loved um i loved uh, the god is not willing uh, i thought it was a uh, fascinating look at uh, some very specific very specific ideas um yeah i i i think i I, it, it's not as much what appeals to me uh, about your work as the Carcana stuff is, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm still happy to see uh, the same or similar setting or familiar settings uh, like yeah. that in, yeah. in Witness. Well, it's, it's a trilogy about legacy. And, mm -hmm. and so once I recognized that, then uh, I had a, a decent focus, something I could um, uh, wrap myself around and, and, and explore, you know? So, um, yeah, it's not it's not as uh, vast or um, expansive as the ten book series, and um, I, I, you know, I did it. I, I don't, I don't have the 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 years or the energy to do it again. So uh, these these are all sort of everything I'm doing now feels like kind of uh, bonus stuff, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll take all the bonus stuff I can get. <laughs> so um, I. Uh, is there sort of writing the two trilogies at the same time or around the same time? Um, do you find that certain ideas that you have for one, you might start thinking, oh, no, I should use that in a different story or the other one or um, they affect each other? Yeah, they would. Uh, that's why I stopped writing uh, and, and both of them at the same time and, and yeah. focused uh, entirely on no life forsaken um absolutely because you know you sit down to write on a session and you may have a scene in mind you've got characters you want to put into place and they have to advance some aspects of the plot but a lot of what is created in that writing session um is generated from who and where you are at that time at that specific time and so you know, if I've been watching historical videos on YouTube about, I don't know, um, the history of, of Africa from, you know, 1600 to you know, 1900, um, there's a lot of information there. And, you know, it, it, it soaks into the brain. And, um, and then when you sit down to write on that day or the next day, um, some of those aspects or themes are, are, they become sort of um, um, fertilizer, if you will, for, for planting uh, specific elements to, to a particular scene you're creating. Um, and so if I were to do that, and then the next day go to uh, Walk in Shadow, you might find some of those same things showing up in the, sec in the other book. And <laughs> I realized I can't do that, right? Um, I could, if I, I suppose if I wanted to, I could create a, uh, a dialogue interplay between the two novels, um, but that's a whole different kind of exercise and mm -hmm. that might just obfuscate things, I think. So uh, this way I can keep them separate and uh, the styles are very different as well. And I don't want to be one having one bleed into the other, so. Um, also kind of on that point, uh... I've seen some like theories online about who characters 
might be going by different names in um, the the Carcanus trilogy. Uh, I'm curious if that's something that you that you're really trying to do with uh, these prequels. Like, oh, I'm going to drop someone in here with a different name, and then they're going to turn out in a sort of twist to be someone that. Well, there's a handful, maybe. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's a handful. Uh, I think some are only referenced very briefly. I think. Hanako, for example, is only referenced with respect to uh, a name on a weapon, something okay. along those lines. In, in uh, um, let's see who else. Um, well, yeah, there's a couple that people have been speculating on for a long time, and I'll just okay. let them speculate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's it was more, you know. Let's sort of get a sense of, of where these things begin. For example, the meeting of Khaled and Brood and, and Animata Rake. Um, and I just thought that would be interesting to have sort of that early, that early period, um, which, you know, if, you, if you're paying attention to the things they say to each other, all of that is fully wrapped by the end of Toll the Hounds, right? That comes full circle. Um, the notions of vengeance and grief uh, just mm -hmm. play right in. Um, so that, I mean, that, uh, it's kind of cheating because, you know, if I'd written the Kirkanis trilogy first and then did the 10 books, uh, then that would have been a pretty long, long haul um, <laughs> to hold off on something. Right. But I, I'm, I'm keeping in mind that most of my readers of the Kirkanis stuff will, ha will have read the 10 book series. Um, so it'll, it'll have more uh, poignancy for them than it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of where I'm at in terms of uh, what I want to do with characters that you're going to recognize. Uh, but in a lot of cases, even my note taking is so much so much rubbish that um, a lot of things that are going to play out in this trilogy. Are going to be contrary to the things you've read in the Malaysian Book of the Fallen, <laughs> but I gave myself that out through right. Through the land, right? right. There's they're storytellers. They'll yeah. They'll do yeah. whatever. Yeah. They'll make it up as they go along. Yeah. Uh huh. Which is kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> um, uh, do you think? Uh, I guess, I guess a big part of uh Fisher, where we've seen Fisher before knowing he's the audience or intended audience, I guess, uh, in this story. Um, I guess he shows up most in Toll the Hounds. Um, mm -hmm. He's in some of Cam's stuff as well, but um, in Toll the Hounds, he has some very important conversations or stuff that felt important to me, at least, uh, with uh, uh, Dweaker. Uh, I'm not sure Dweaker. if that's... Yeah, uh, and just about telling his story in a historical way versus telling it in a uh, much more, well, I don't even want to say a narrativized way because this a historical way is a narrativized way. Uh, yeah. But um, but yeah, kind of going off of that, uh, I'm curious if as Fisher's listening to this story that he's being told, um, if that impacts his conversations later on, or I, I guess, is, is Fisher just, I mean, how old is he? Is he really, like, does his age, like, yeah, actually, I, the, the other thing is, you, you don't even know the time period in which Galan is telling the story to Fisher. Right. Uh, I mean, there's enough hints from both Cam and I that Fisher could well be an ascendant, um, well, the god of art, if you will, or the, mm -hmm. or the god of poetry. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there's a timeless quality to to all that. Um, timeless in the sense of outside of our notions of, of time and space. Mm -hmm. So when that when that story is being told is is left entirely up. So we don't know whether we know that he, he has written Anna Mandaris because Galan comments on it. Okay, right, right. Yeah, or he's writing it at the time. It might be one or the other. I can't remember. So. Um, it is uh, a fissure that could well be post um, Cripple God, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So in which case, yeah, he's, he's, he's free to interpret this as he will or record it as he may be doing. Yeah.
All right. All right. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have too many more uh, like specific questions or anything for you, mm -hmm. um, but I guess I'll, I'll just ask, is there anything that when people talk about this, these prequels, uh, are there certain ideas or characters even or storylines that you're surprised don't get brought up and that you might like if you're talking to a first time reader or someone who's going to go back and reread them, um, things that you might say, try and look for this theme in there, or try and look for how much this character does whatever. Um, mm. Is there anything like that, that that you're sort of surprised isn't, hasn't been catching on or hasn't? Yeah. I don't know. Um, the, like you said earlier, the, there isn't very much engagement. Um, that I've experienced uh, with this, these first two books of the trilogy. Um, I'm really not sure. I mean, I was kind of surprised that it was um, seemed problematic in, in given how, uh, as I mentioned earlier, how traditional uh, the fantasy trope aspects are of this particular mm -hmm. novel. Um, but I guess maybe the language got in the way of that. Who knows? Um, certainly possible. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, nothing. Yeah, nothing's really. Nothing's really coming to mind. I, I mean, I'm always pleased when somebody mentions something that they liked, um, <laughs> and I just sort of, I'm happy for that. Um, I know there's some dialogue that occurs. You know the escorts that they they have, um, the brother and the sister, and uh, that Draconis and Arathan are with. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. I really enjoyed writing those those characters. Um, and yeah, it gets pretty twisted in a couple of places. I seem to recall. Uh huh. Um, but nobody really sort of brings them up. So. Okay. Yeah. Um. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, again, I, I don't have too much more to say uh, mm -hmm. in this conversation, um, but uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on here. Is there anything, just anything, any topic at all that uh, you'd like to? No, I think I'm all talked about. All right. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Um,